Stretch your hand this way. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, you have given us opportunity after opportunity, Lord, to experience your holiness, your greatness, your purity, your love. Today is going to be one more moment of that. It's going to be one more time, Lord. You're going to pour out your spirit upon these people. I thank you for that. God, I need you to do in the spirit realm what I cannot do in the physical. I need your anointing to begin flowing like a river in this building. I need you, God, to take us to places we've never even seen before. My God. Oh, hallelujah. Mm. My God, we need the Holy Ghost. Lord, we can build grand cathedrals and we can have the largest choirs, but Lord, without you, we're nothing. God, I thank you that you are here and you dwell among us and within us and that, Lord, because we love you and because we proclaim the name of Jesus, we have accepted Jesus as our Savior, that you dwell with us, Emmanuel, God with us. Now move in this building. Lord, do things for people today they were not expecting. Bring transformation to hearts, minds, and lives. We commit this service to you and this word to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. I do want to make mention we are offering a nursery. This is a ministry we're starting to offer. If anyone has children, small babies and children, you're welcome to take them to your left. Children, uh, uh, six and older, I believe, we're going with Miss Kayla for Children's Church, Lifesavers Children's Ministry. Amen. How many of you love our kids? I miss them when they're not in here, but I know they're uh, receiving word that's specifically for them. Uh, but I'm glad they're able to worship with us during the music part of the service. Amen. I feel a very special move in the Spirit of God today. Appreciate what you share, Brother Aaron Bowley. That was right on time. Through the Sunday school, uh, more than one teacher has, I, well, I sat through one class, auditorium class, and I spoke with another. And it seemed like everybody's got us, or God's got all of us on the same line of thinking, returning to holiness and getting into the place that God wants us to be so we can be most effective for his kingdom. Amen. I want to preach for just a moment this morning on the beauty of holiness. The beauty of holiness. 1 Chronicles 16, 29. We're going to read this together if they'll, when they get it up on the screen. And if uh, it takes more than a few seconds, I may just run with it. I don't. matter of fact, I don't think that scripture is going to be on there, is it? That was one of my last-minute additions. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 16, 29. If you are old school and you have a Bible, if you're new school and you've got a phone that's smart, you can look up 1 Chronicles 16, 29. I love to preach on topics that are hilarious. I like to laugh. I like to bring stories from the Bible into modern times and us have a, a, just a good time together and relate to it. But then every so often the Lord moves on you and he says, get back to your roots. Get back to where you were birthed from. Preach, Michael, on holiness. That's what I'm going to do today. And we're going to look at 1 Chronicles 16, 29. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness is a beautiful thing. Sometimes it gets a little distorted and because of the way it's presented, we feel like it's uh, a lot of religious rules and rituals uh, that we are being dictated to uh, by certain leaders. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, holiness is beautiful. Thank you, Ben. Holiness is beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. Amen? According to God's Word. I want you to see in verse 29 one more time that proper worship is always connected to holiness. Proper worship is always connected to holiness. For you to be acceptable when you come together at New Haven Church of God or any church that you would go to or if it might be in your home, where, wherever you come together with other, other believers and you worship the Lord, the type that is acceptable is from a holy vessel. 
We're going to get into some stuff today you've probably never heard in your life. Some of you might get a little grossed out, but it's going to be all right. Just hang with me. I've said before that uh, I don't know how popular CSI is now, but for years they, they come out with a new one about every six months. CSI Miami, C, they just CSI, I think, New York, CSI Special something, SVU, SUV, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and I said, we watch grosser stuff than what I say from this pulpit, so I ain't really worried about it. But we're going to get into some, some things that I believe you'll take with you today, and you'll never look at worship the same way again. Uh, holiness is not something that can be purchased or bargained for. You could mind your manners from the time you were a child. You could avoid ever saying a bad word in your life. Wow. You could never cheat on tests, and you could try to always help people who are in need and still never achieve a level of holiness. So it causes me to have to ask the question, how, Pastor, are we able to become holy? Well, that is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Then he said, this is Jesus that is uh, being referred to, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He was saying, I've come to do the will of the Father. He sets aside the first. What is the first? That is the blood covenant that God required, the blood sacrifice that was demanded in the early Levitical law and the Mosaic law, where that God said, in order for your sins to be covered, I need you to offer me a blood sacrifice of an, a firstborn lamb. There were other animals that were used. But we do know that this was symbolic of what was to come through the blood of Jesus Christ. But originally in the Old Testament, we go all the way back to Adam, and we find that he and Eve had two children, Cain and Abel. And in the early uh, chapters of Genesis, we find that Abel knew how to sacrifice to God. Matter of fact, his sacrifice was acceptable because he took from his own flock a lamb and offered it as a sacrifice. From that point on, we see sacrifice instituted and, and it actually being written down so that future generations after Moses would understand exactly how to carry out sacrifice. But Jesus said <clears throat> that the Father sets aside the first to establish the second. Now, one of probably any preacher in this room's favorite topics to preach on is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's the most powerful message on the planet. It is the message that causes Satan to cringe. It causes atheists to get uncomfortable. It causes agnostics to second guess what they've been learning. It causes the people who are sitting on the back pew and they've just scooted through and thinking because mom and daddy saved, I'll just make it into glory. But when the preacher stands up and speaks of the demands of the cross and how that Jesus Christ died because your sins were that ugly, your sins were that horrible and devastating that it killed him on the cross. He became your sin and he died so that you wouldn't have to. When you preach Christ and him crucified, it changes the game. It messes up the balance. It causes uh, truth to outweigh deception. Oh, hallelujah. I hope somebody's with me today because I'm feeling something in the room. Amen. He said, and by that will, verse 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Your holiness that I'm preaching about today begins and ends with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You have been made holy because your holiness was purchased. It was paid for. Now that's great news because that takes a little bit of pressure off. But Brother Randy, before we feel too relieved, understand that there are some demands upon the body of Christ when it comes to holiness. That we can't just scoot into heaven and say, well, my holiness was purchased by Christ, so I'll just live the way I want to. And because I prayed a prayer back when I was 16, God's just going to open up the gates and say, come on in, even though you're an adulterer and a drug addict and you slept around with everybody and you, you looked at your porn and you drank your alcohol till you got drunk. And, oh, Pastor, you didn't have to go there. We're going to have Thanksgiving meal in a minute. Keep our stomachs feeling good, Pastor. <clears throat> holiness demands a lifestyle change. It requires it. You have to make up your mind that you are not going to depend just on one prayer, but you are going to depend upon the Holy Spirit who dwells within you to daily help you overcome the desires of the flesh. I told you it's going to get a little bit gross. Here we go. Y'all ready? I want you to think about holiness involved with worship like this. 
You invite a guest over. Now, no one has done this in the fellowship hall, so don't think that. But you invite a guest over to your home. You prepare a delicious meal, spaghetti and meatballs. You sprinkle some of that cheese on there. You got the thick garlic bread. Slaver that, that butter on it. You've heated it just right. You got a big old glass of sweet tea, and I ain't talking plastic in a Care Bears cup. I'm talking glass. <laughs> Come on, somebody. So now you're preaching the right message. And you notice when you sit down and, and you begin to eat that delicious spaghetti that on the left side of that plate is a big old uh, gross dried up mashed potato from three weeks ago. You're thinking now it smells good. The spaghetti looks good. I'm sure that it was prepared right. But there's some stuff from the past on there that's grossing me out and it's causing me to lose my appetite. You see, here's where the beauty of holiness comes into play. There's some people coming into churches across the United States of America every Sunday morning. And some of them may lift their hands and some may not. They may be reserved. But regardless of how they present themselves in worship, they're... Lord, there's some things from their past that's just flat out gross. There's some grudges, my God help me, there's some grudges somebody brings in with their worship and they say, well, just because I say the right words and I sing the songs that sound like everybody in the building, yet what the people can't see and God can't see, I've got some dried up grudges from about three months ago or three years ago that I've that I've not dealt with. I got some mess where people uh, dissed on me and people talked about me and people cursed me out and people cheated on me and people did some stuff. And I come in and I say, Dear Jesus, I love you, I worship you, I praise you, and yet all God can see is that big old glob of grudge sitting on the left side of your plate. There's too many people coming into the house of the Lord and from their vessel they're pouring out delicious sweet tea of praise and all the time all God can smell is the odor of Jack Daniels at the bottom of the glass. Oh, come on, somebody. Uh, so you sound like you're picking on certain things. Well, I don't, I don't want to pick on certain things. I want to pick on this. There's some stuff that's got to get cleaned up in our life if we're going to offer worship to God. Some people have been thinking, well, as long as I say the right words, as long as I raise my hand a certain way, God's just going to accept it. And God loves it when we worship Him. But here's what bothers God. It bothers Him when we bring in stuff that should have been dealt with a long time ago into the house of worship. And He says, I can hardly get past what you're dealing with in order to even hear the heart of worship. And we might stay here for just a little while. God's trying to help the church of America. And I'm sure other nations are hearing the same word from the Holy Ghost. But he's trying to say that I need you to worship me in the beauty of holiness. Holiness does not begin when you walk through the doors and you're doing your Catholic. I don't know if they do follow Son, Holy Ghost, or, or if you're doing the Baptist, dipping in the baptistry, or if you're doing the Pentecostal coming in, you shaking a G. I don't care about that stuff. It does not matter what denomination you are, what rituals you follow, or, or what you think. When you walk in the door, it's not the time to be trying to pull off something to get you right with God. Amen. You need to be living right from the minute you wake up in the morning till you go to bed at night. Don't wait on the preacher to preach a good message on Sunday morning and say, well, I'm going to wait till I get there and I'm going to get right with God. You need to live holy every moment of your life. You say, well, Pastor, that sounds like a... A tough ticket. That, that's a hard thing to do. It's not hard, Sister Phyllis, to live holy when the Holy Ghost is in you. Well, I didn't know that. Pastor, I, I've been saved for a while and the Spirit of God lives in me, but I'm still struggling to live holy. Well, here's the thing. You've got to learn to allow the spirit man to choke hold the flesh man. you got to, uh, you got, oh, I'm going to go old school on him. you got to get a Rowdy Rodney Piper and do some DDT and on, oh, Jesus, on the enemy that's trying to destroy your soul. Mm, I'm about ready to see God body slam some demons and some lives in this place. I don't even like wrestling. I don't know why I'm preaching like this. I don't like wrestling, but I like seeing what happens to the enemy when we pull a move on him. Amen? Woo, Jesus. I love him. So we've got to be careful what we bring into the house of Almighty God. Say, well, it doesn't just apply to the church. 
See, God still sees the same leftovers from three weeks ago when you're sitting in your car and you're cranking up that worship music and you're really getting going. You're singing to the top of your lungs and God's saying, I love what you're doing, but there's some, there's some lust in your life that you, you keep allowing to happen on Monday mornings and on Friday nights and on Saturdays about 3 p.m. in the afternoon when everybody leaves the house and you, you have your own thing going on. And he said, I love your worship, but there's some stuff, my God, there's some stuff in your life that's starting to smell up the good aroma. It's starting to overwhelm the goodness of your life. I need you to come to me in the beauty of holiness. Jesus, help us. Your worship must be in holiness. Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you. I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I'm calling out. I, if I could get on my knees, I'd beg you. That's pretty much what Paul's saying right here. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. By the mercies of God. He's saying, I know it's going to take mercy. I know you don't have it in you. I know you're a bunch of wimps. Now, I'm not saying that about you. But Paul's saying, I know we are a bunch of wimps. And that the next temptation comes by, we're liable to just give in and be like, oh, what happened? He said, I understand that, but by the mercies of God. In other words, it's got to... We got to have a part of God in order to even overcome, amen? By the mercies of God, here it is, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He didn't say vote on it at the next council meeting. He didn't say if majority rules and, and you guys decide we're going to be a holy church, that it'll be okay, and if y'all decide you don't want to be a holy church, I'll still let you come on into glory. no. He said, I beseech you. He's saying it is demanded, it is commanded, you are being commissioned. You've got to live holy. Why is that such a big deal? Well, it's for the same reason that it means something to me when my girls come to church here and Roxy Jane just don't haul off and curse one of you teachers out. It's the same reason that that matters to me. Because I don't need Roxy Jane, and I know she don't do everything I want, but I don't need her uh, taking crayons and writing all over uh, the front doors of the church, and y'all walk in and say, oh, it's just Roxy Jane. That's not acceptable. Amen? Amen. There are things that I require of Chloe. She can't go make out with the uh, latest boy that walks through the doors, and I catch them in the back. And, uh, boy, I'm not speaking anything prophetically. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. But I, I ain't going to have my 13-year-old my daughter making out with a boy behind the church. You know why? Because it's unacceptable. That behavior will be dealt with promptly. And yet we look at God and say, well, God's going to let us slide. God's going to let us look at our porn. God's going to let us uh, get drunk. God's going to let us go out partying and telling dirty jokes. God's going to let us watch stuff on our TV that's uh, promoting homosexuality and promoting all kind, of <clears throat> all kind of evil. And he's just going to let us slide because he understands the way we are. And he knows we're still going to show up on Sunday and we're still going to pay our tithes and we're going to raise our hands and love on Jesus. If you won't let your kids slide, what makes you think God's just going to overlook everything that we do? Man, that's such a hard-sounding message. I sound like an evangelist. I sound like one of them preachers that's not going to be here next week. I'm preaching anything I want. And I'm like, hey, praise God, I'll get the offering. We're gone. No. You just got to realize when you, when you got the package of this pastor, you got pastor slash evangelist. It does not leave you, Brother Ricky. <laughs> Holiness. He said, if you're going to worship me, I am demanding that it be in the beauty of Holiness. It's what God requires. It's what God is, is saying we must have. So the next time you go to uh, or getting in that situation that you know you struggle with, the next time you get into a situation where you know you're weak and that you, you need to work on it, instead of saying, well, God just understands my weakness, how about saying, God, help me to get to a place where that I cannot tolerate it anymore. God, get me to a place where I hate the thing that binds me. My God, get me to a place where I detest that thing that my body craves, but my spirit man screams out, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. God, get me to a place where I love you so much that I hate everything that's against you. My God, help me to love Jesus so much that I hate sin and I detest the ways of the flesh. You better be careful. We're about to get into old, old time holiness preaching if I don't watch it. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. Exodus chapter 3. Verses 1 through 5. I want to tell you an amazing story. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand, being fugit. For the place where you stand, Brittany Hubbard, where you stand, Jesse Collier, that place is holy ground. God was marking his territory. I got to make a quick point, and we're going to move on. We're going to jump back on the interstate after we get stop at this jet pep. I want to make a quick point that God didn't just bring his holiness here for a one-time move. Oh, we're going to go somewhere right here. See, what most people do not know when they read this scripture is this wasn't a, a one-shot deal with God. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to make this ground holy, and then we'll see you later. You know, we'll just make it a ghost town. No, God made sure Moses knew this ain't the last time, son, you come into this mountain. He said, I'm, matter of fact, just to prove who I am, a few scriptures down, he said, to prove who I am, I guarantee you that you're going to lead the entire nation of Israel out of Egypt, and we're going to meet back and have some church on this mountain. That's what God was pretty much telling him. And here's what happened. The same mountain where that the burning bush was was at and God spoke to Moses is the same mountain where the Ten Commandments, you say, well, I thought that was Mount Sinai. Well, based on two of the um, original, I'm trying to remember the exact, Pentateuch of the five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Based on two of those, it's referred to as Mount Sinai. And when you read Exodus, you'll find that it's referred to as Mount Horeb. I'm starting to feel like <laughs> somebody is spouting off stuff. I'm trying to hurry here. but uh, So it's the exact same location. This tells me that God didn't finish up with the burning bush. He just got it started. He started a forest fire that no hose could put out, no fireman, no truck with a big old ladder on it could come put it out. So when Moses and the children of Israel came into the wilderness God met him on that mountain and gave him the ten commandments that wasn't the only thing another reason that the ground was made holy was because the Bible says on this mountain there would come a point where the Israelites would run out of water now I don't know about you but you want to see a revolution or you want to see an uprising you let the water system in America get hit with some kind of terrorism you'll have a bunch of crazy people they'll be jumping in creeks trying to gulp down they'll look for whales when you don't have water you starve to death and you die the Israelites were almost starving they cried out did you bring us out of Egypt to let us die and God spoke to Moses he said get back to the mountain he said remember where I, I lit up a torch remember where I, I burned a bush but it was not consumed get back up to that mountain when they start asking for water well wait a minute God I don't understand because that was a place of fire and it was dry how could anything there help me right now but God said I, I get, get back to the mountain so what did Moses do he went back to the mountain and God said take that rod in your hand boy and you strike the rock on top of Mount Horeb and as soon as that rod hits that rock living water is going to come out and it will satisfy the taste of whoever is thirsty so when God makes something holy he doesn't just offer the fire. See, some churches got caught up in Pentecostal fire and they couldn't think of nothing else. They got so excited, they was running the aisle, speaking in tongues, shouting, falling out in the spirit, and the pastor can't even preach sometimes to some people because all they want to do is speak in tongues and have a Holy Ghost fit. But see, my God's more than a God of fire. He's a God of living water. That tells me that there's going to be souls coming in who don't know about the Holy Ghost. There's going to be people who don't understand about speaking in tongues. But there's one thing they understand. They understand they're thirsty and somebody better give them some water because I feel like I'm about to die and in those places you don't need Pentecostal fire at that moment you need somebody that will speak about the cross Jesus crucified buried raised from the dead and let living water come from your well and satisfy their soul my God I feel the Holy Ghost today God was marking his territory this was a place where that God was going to do something miraculous. He said, Moses, take your sandals off because the place where that you stand is holy ground. That confuses me because I would imagine in my small mind and limited thought process that God would pick a place that was paved. I would figure God might take us to a waterfall 
Or maybe he would uh, say, first of all, before I make the ground holy, Moses, I need you to uh, get a crew that lays uh, gold, and you get some good gold blocks in here, make sure they're polished, and, and I want everything to be perfect, and then I'll make the ground holy. But see, God didn't do that. God showed up when there was nothing but dirt and rocks and a scrawny little old bush. And he said, I'll still make it holy. Here's the good word to the church today. When God saw you, mm, Jesus, when God, oh, Lord. When God saw you, you were not polished. You were not finished. Matter of fact, some of you should have been thrown in the junkyard. But God said, wait a minute, I'll make them holy anyway. Wait just a minute. I know they got a foul mouth. I know they smoke some dope. I know that they get drunk. I know that they party. I know they got some sexual stuff that ain't right in their life. But I'll make them holy because when I touch them, they'll want to walk away from some of that mess and get a hold of something that's pure and real. I hope somebody else is feeling what I'm feeling in this place. I got more of a hunger right now for the meat of the word than I do some, some dressing and chicken back there in the back. Amen. That's coming. But right now, I'm hungry. I'm hungry for God's word. No matter what you have done, no matter where you've come from, no matter what you've been through or what anybody's done to you, God can look at you. And if you're willing to say, God, I let it go. It's just me and you on this mountain. God says, I'll make you holy. I'll make you holy holy. Some people look at you and say you ain't nothing but dirt. They call you a scoundrel. They call you a cheater. They call you all kind of bad words that I can't say behind the pulpit or anywhere else. But God looks at you and he says but I call you holy because I know where you're going. I know what my blood, my God, I know what the Holy Ghost can do through you. I call you holy. Uh, let people curse you out. Just love them back and say I know what you're telling me I am but God says I'm holy. Let your kids act like hoodlums when they hit teenage. I hope, I hope they won't. But watch what happens when they act like a bunch of hoodlums and they skip out and say, I don't want to live with you no more. And you say, well, you might think that because you might say my rules are too hard and you hate my guts right now. But God says I'm holy. And guess what? He's already spoken over you, son or daughter. You're going to be holy too. Some people have major family problems with in-laws. Can't stand them. Certainly would never build a mother-in-law suite. Can I get an amen? But yeah, when they talk to you like you're some five-year-old kid and you have been running a business for 15 years and you got your own place, you're paying your own bills. I'm not speaking from experience. Don't think that because I got great in-laws. But I'm saying if you're in that situation, look at them when they're running you down at Thanksgiving in, a, in about two weeks and say, I know my... I, why, just put a big old bean green in your mouth when you're saying this. And so, I know some of you didn't get that, did you? Get, put your big, a couple of green beans in your mouth and enjoy it while you're saying it. And say, I know what you say about me and that I've never measured up to who you thought your daughter or your son deserved. But God said I'm holy. Woo my Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost. God says you're holy. Verse number six. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I'm glad God does not forget about the people who blazed a trail for me and you. I'm glad God doesn't say, well, I'm all about the last day's move. I, yeah, we love the people of the 50s, 60s, 70s, but forget them. We're all about the new thing. No, I'm glad God never forgets those who've blazed this trail. Boy, I'm hoping to get into some good stuff tonight about that, about uh, Pentecost in the 1800s and early 1900s. But let me just quickly say this. And you've heard this before, but many of us would not be here today, probably most of us, if not for somebody in our lives that pointed us in this direction. Somebody held on to the horns of the altar. That's, that's just an Old Testament term. Somebody grabbed hold of God and they spoke your name when you should have went and died and possibly went to hell. But somebody prayed for us. I'm glad God doesn't forget them. Hebrews tells us we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. That tells me somebody's rooting on Brother Ricky and Deanna. Somebody's rooting for Aaron and Selena. God, God, somebody is rooting for us up in heaven and saying, don't you give up yet. We, we're running this race together. We handed off the baton, Colton, to you and your generation. Don't you quit. Don't you give up. Don't get tired. Don't, don't stop. And I'm glad that God doesn't forget about those who went before us. I think we go through seasons <clears throat> many times. And I've been going through a season here lately where I can't get enough of old-time preaching. I was listening this morning from a message from 1978, and it broke me what I was hearing. 
It was a good message. But what I was hearing was that even then there was so much compromise in the church. 1978, it was spoken, I believe, to a camp meeting in the Church of God. And I don't even remember the minister's name, but I sat and I listened and I thought, even then... There was so much compromise, and, and, and he was speaking of, of this false Pentecost. Uh, I mean, he believed in the real kind, but he said there was this mess coming through that said you could do whatever you felt was okay with your flesh, and God would still baptize you. You could still live, uh, or you could still call yourself holy and make it to heaven. And, and I'm thankful even back then he was saying that was a lie. Amen. Thank the Lord. And there's still some preachers today willing to stand up and say it. Amen. It's not that we're bullies or we're trying to uh, make people feel bad in the congregation. It's this fact, the exact same thing that I mentioned earlier, that when you set your child down in front of you at home, you don't sit there and tell them what they want to hear. You don't say, well, if it feels good to you, go ahead and hop in the back seat with that boy. Go ahead and uh, uh, shoot up on those drugs as long as it feels good and you're not hurting anybody else. I'm glad we've got parents in this church who don't say that kind of garbage. If they say, here's what I expect of you. I know you won't be perfect, but I'll be praying for you all the way. When that boy says something to you about getting in the back seat, I've already prayed over it and anointed it. So in the name of Jesus, by the time that he opens his door on his left side and he's got his arm around you, he's going to feel something run down his spine and you're going to have an unction. Can I get an amen from the Holy Ghost because daddy's been praying for you. Does that mean that kids always do what we hope for? Absolutely not. But it does mean you've got a job to do, parents. That there's something you can do to cover them. So God was saying, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God did not forget about those who had gone before Moses. He was also letting Moses know, hey, son, I've been around a lot longer than you have. I've been at this for generations. You've been at it for about 30, 40 years. To 80 years, God knows everything. When God tells you to do something, trust him. Well, God, what about the repercussions? What, uh, fear starts kicking in. Doubt starts to hit your mind and say, but what if, what if? God says, I didn't tell you to question me with what ifs. I said, do what I told you. When you obey the Lord, he will always see you through. Amen. And Moses did something. On that mountain that probably we would have done. Moses hid his face. For he was afraid to look upon God. The call of God requires much more than just repentance and confession. The call of God demands holiness. Moses realized that. God was sharing with him the place where you stand is holy ground. And it was starting to hit Moses. And he realized God... This thing's bigger than me. It wasn't just about the mission of leading people out of Egypt. No. It wasn't just about the thought of going and facing Pharaoh when uh, Moses probably had most wanted posters of his face, if they had something like that, in Egypt because he was a murderer. He had killed an Egyptian, and that's why he fled. I don't know if there were posters up or not. But it wasn't just because he was thinking of those things. I believe the reason that Moses hid his face was he was realizing this thing's bigger than me. He had been educated in Egypt. I don't know if you know this, but that was some of the best education a person could receive at that time would be to be raised in Egypt. He'd been raised as a son or, ne or nephew of the Pharaoh. I guess it would have been like a grandson, the daughter of uh, Pharaoh, and she took in Moses, so he would have been like a grandson. But none of that mattered because what he came face to face with on this day through the form of a burning bush outweighed everything he had ever felt or seen in his life. And God spoke something and he said, remove your sandals for the place that you are standing is holy ground. There's sometimes Colton's up here singing on praise to him. He'll take his shoes off for that reason. He feels the presence of God moving in here strongly and he just doesn't feel like he should keep his shoes on. Maybe some of you feel that way. I'm going to try to finish with this point because I, I really feel like that uh, the Lord's bringing it to a close. Uh, thank you, Lord, for speaking right now. Why was it important that he took his sandals off, of all things? Why not his robe or cloak? Or why not just lay down what's in your hands? That would sound reasonable. He said, remove your sandals. 
And I think this still applies to us today because God looks at the church of the United States now. And I believe he's saying to us, there's some things that have brought you quite a ways. There's some things that got you here. But right now, you've got to quit depending on those things. See, some of you only got here because of the prayers of your mother, your daddy, or, or grandparent. God says, but there comes a point you've got to quit depending on what got you here. You've got to quit depending on those who put the soles on your feet and pointed you in the direction and, and, and said, watch out for the rocks and make, uh, make sure you don't get in the valleys. But, but there comes a point where you've got to take off some of the things that might have got you to where you are. You still appreciate them and you're still going to maybe have access to them later. But right now, God says, I need the church to get to a point where they absolutely depend upon me to take them wherever that I want them to go. See, sometimes we look and say, well, I, I can't make this happen because I don't have the money. We, we can't do this in ministry because we don't have the money. God says, quit, quit depending on and worrying about something that you can't control anyway. He says, would you take the sandals of dependency for maybe more funds and just lay them aside for a minute and just let God move? Would you just trust me for just a minute? Say, Pastor, I've tried every medicine. I've tried to get set up for surgeries. My body is just messed up. They keep telling me bad reports. God says, I, I use doctors. I use medicine. I use nurses. But would you take off some of the dependence on some of that right now and just get in my presence? I'm not some fanatical who believes you never have to have surgery or anything, so just know that. But sometimes God speaks to us, and he just says, will you for a moment quit depending on anybody else or anything else and lay it all aside and would you just recognize my holiness because see there's there's too many times that the things we brought with us distort that beauty of holiness and we try to get in the presence of God and we say God I'm hitting the wall God I love you I'm saved but I see other people over here and they'll worship God and they're just walking with smiles on their face they got joy and I don't understand what's wrong there's a whole lot of reasons, but today the message is specifically about something. He's saying, clean your plates. Wash out the cups. Get the forks and spoons and get some more of that uh, Ajax and get the scrubber. Don't depend on a rag. Get the thing that's got some grit to it with my word. And it's not going to feel good. That's probably why it stayed on the plate so long because it was just easy with a rag just to wipe over it. And it's like, oh, I'll get that later. Week after week, it stays there looking as nasty as it did three weeks ago. And you, you're just trying to ignore it. And you're eating your delicious meal. And, 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 and every time that you put that fork up to your mouth, you look and you see that mess on your plate. It's done dried up. It's probably growing some fungus. Say, Pastor, that's not a way to end a message. Well, I, I got to tell you the truth that God's saying that it's time to clean your plates. And get to a place where you come to me in the beauty of holiness. Your lives must be holy. I'm not a hardliner that's going to write a list of rules for you. I'm not going to tell you you got to do all this, and if you don't, you're not going to heaven. That's not biblical for me to do that. I tell you to read the Word. And if you got questions, you come to me and ask, of course. But what God's trying to tell you today is not about rules. It's not about Him pulling out a whip and saying, oh, you got to toe the line. No, He's saying you need to clean your plates. There's some hardening of hearts that's happened. It's got to be dealt with. Ooh. There's some hardness. God says, I got to deal with it. I got to get you back in the oven. I got to get you back where the all consuming fire is burning and moving because I got to melt some things in you. God said, I got to take some rough edges of my word. And there's going to be times pastors going to stand up and say stuff that does not feel good and you don't like it. But what I'm doing, I'm using the word through him to scrub that mess off your vessel so that you can pour out clean, pure water of worship unto me. I've got an anointing for your life and I want it to flow without any reservation and no distractions. But there's things in your life that you've got to let me deal with. Pastor, I thought if I was saved, that'd be all I needed. Well, it's, it's the best start. But there's things in our lives that's got to be dealt with. Your worship's about to change. Good news. Your praise is about to reach another level. Because somebody's going to make sure today 
that before they even leave the building, they're going to say, God, I'm surrendering everything. I'm fed up with it. I've tried to carry it. I've tried to ignore it. I've tried not to look at it, but it's there, and I know it, and it's affecting different parts of my life that I don't like it affecting. I've tried to say it's not, but it is, and the, the Holy Ghost is speaking to me now, Pastor, and I know you're talking to me, but I, I, I've just got to get to a point. I'm going to let God have his way, and my worship's going to take off to another level. Stand with me, church. We'll finish this tonight. If the Lord allows. Holy Spirit, you have spoken to us. It's not been the most comfortable messages, but God, that's not what we uh, asked for when we got saved. We didn't say make us comfortable. We wanted you to change us, to make us more like Christ. God, you're doing that through your word and your anointing. And Lord, as I pray right now, I ask, Lord, that you would help those in this congregation to pray with me. Lord, if there be anything in their lives that is a distraction, a hindrance, something from the past, if there's anything blocking them from joy or peace, right now, God, I pray that you're going to help them. Mm. As Ben plays, I just want you to, if you want to come pray, you're welcome to. But as he plays, if you'll just pray, even if it's right where you are, that's fine. Somebody's got to touch God right now. Say, God, clean my plate, clean my soul, clean my vessel. Lord, don't let there be anything else that's distracting anymore. Heal me, God. Deliver me, God. Thank you. Just remain with us just a few moments while we pray, please, church. Yes, it's